7日の副業にかけて親衛部隊が後輩とコレヒドールへ押し寄せた時敵はもはや成功する。Jap newsreel cameramen had themselves a field day on May 6, 1942. Americans will remember that date. May 6, 1942. That was when Corregidor fell. This is a Jap's eye view of the ceremonies. was rushed by plane to Tokyo. They loved it there. And in Manila, the whole Jap fifth column came out to welcome General Masaharu Hama, conqueror of the Philippines. It was the biggest day of General Hama's life, and 50,000 fanatic Jap soldiers bought it for him with their lives. As far as the general was concerned, it would have been cheap at twice the price. He'd already put himself on record. Quote, Japan is prepared to lose 10 million lives in her war with America. How many is America prepared to lose? Well, it wasn't an easy question to answer. Life isn't cheap in America. We don't raise our boys to be gods in little white boxes. We had other ideas. And by February 44, the Japs were beginning to find out. In the Southwest Pacific area alone, our lines of communication and supply had to cover amazing distances. A comparison of the United States with only a portion of this area shows the tremendous logistic problem. Our strategic objectives in the Southwest Pacific were New Britain and New Ireland. Possession of these islands would isolate the Japs left in the Solomons protect the right flank of the Australian units, shoving up the east coast of New Guinea toward Medang, and cut two of the three major supply lines feeding New Guinea. But the New Britain and New Ireland Japs were entrenched in a strong zone of defense. Medang, Waywak, the Admiralties, Kaviang, and at the heart, tough, troop-packed Rabaul. Each fortress had a harbor for ships and subs, airfields crowded with planes, fat concentrations of men. So, how to take New Britain and New Ireland? One way was to pour everything we had into a head-on attack, but that costs a lot of lives. To get the same results at the smallest cost called for a better strategy, and strategy is their business. Here's the strategy. First, grab the Admiralties. Why? Because those islands are a vital link in the chain of supply to New Britain and New Ireland. How? Throw a feint at New Britain, a naval bombardment. The Japs expect the punch there. But our real objectives will be two airstrips in the Admiralties. One on Manus Island, largest of the Admiralty group, the other on Los Negros. The South Pacific Air Force will guard our right flank with bombs and Kaviang. Australian infantry, supported by our 5th Air Force, will protect our left flank by smashing toward Medang. The Pacific Fleet will hammer truck to disrupt the flow of supply and reinforcements. These feints and diversions should keep the Japs busy. At the right time, the 1st Cavalry Division will jump off for the Admiralties, while the 6th Infantry Division stands by, just in case. That's a lot of plan, but it's only the beginning. Once we've sunk our heels into the Admiralties, another task force can drive a wedge between Medang and Waywak at Hansa Bay. At the same time, Admiral Halsey's South Pacific forces will drive against Kaviang. What will all this accomplish? The complete isolation of New Britain and New Ireland. The Japs can surrender or rot.
But Army intelligence knows that no plan can be final until D-Day because information of the enemy keeps flowing in from many sources, constantly changing what we already know. And latest information from the Admiralties was getting interesting. Pilots buzzing the airstrip on Los Negros Island reported very light ACAC, no aerial interception. And what was most interesting, the airstrip looked deserted. To make sure, a scouting patrol was slipped into Los Negros. Six men whose job for 24 hours would be to see without being seen. They saw Jap Marines, thousands of them. But their defenses were not manned and their outposts were lax, carelessly inviting surprise. Our picture of the Admiralties is clearer now. Look it over. Manus, strong. Los Negros, weak, exposed to attack from the east. If we could grab the airstrip on Los Negros first, we could use land-based planes to air protect our big try against Manus. It would no longer be necessary to assemble a full-scale amphibious force. We'd save six weeks on our timetables. The chance was too good to miss. Monday, February 28, 1944. Quietly, secretly. 800 men assemble for invasion. Reconnaissance in force to bite off the first beachhead in the Admiralties. Men of the 1st Cavalry Division, whose 7th Regiment once died with Custer, now ride again, this time in Higgins boats. Eight hundred men to invade an island holding more than three thousand Japs. Risky? Plenty. But it's a calculated risk, based on what we know about our opponent's hand. This is no armada. A small fleet. A fistful of men to do a job planned for a division. But armed with war's best weapon. Surprise. They'll hit the beach tomorrow at 0815. That's H hour. D-Day, Los Negros Island. Spitfires, air cover on the way. The first wave goes over the side. Spits peel off for attack. Diving in pairs, they plaster the beach. A few Jap guns are still alive, but the first wave keeps moving in. B-25s, low level, heavy stuff. H hour minus five seconds. Four. Three. Two. One. H hour. Yank footprints on a Jap beachhead. becomes personal. It's always personal for the guy on the ground. A Jap's a tough target. You know he's around, 
That's all you know. This kind of fighting is different. You feel your way. Follow a hunch, a sound. This is jungle war. Delayed by enemy shore batteries, the second wave finally gets through. More men, more firepower. the edge of the strip, but we're pinned down, outnumbered. The Air Force cuts them down to size. Yank patrols get across. We take the strip. H hour plus 480. A shrewd military gamble pays off. Time for decisions. Exploiting initial success. Reinforcements. Supplies. Tactics. Defense against counterattacks. And now, it's hold on to what you've got. Three days, three nights, they held on against frenzied suicidal counterattacks till Los Negro Strip was ours. For the Corps men and medics, no office hours. Private Tower, one of our cameramen, fatally wounded. Final count, 61 Americans. Japs, 3,000. A new management takes over. Bulldozers turn bomb craters into runways. We're in business. Our first plane lands on the Admiralties. With the airstrip in our hands, we fought on to take all of Los Negros. It was now practical for the rest of the 1st Cavalry Division to jump to Manus. Next, units of the 1st Marine Division cross from Gloucester to take the airstrip near Talasia, only 160 air miles from Rabaul. Another marine unit springs on two of the St. Matthias Islands, north of Caviang in New Ireland. Look at the map now. Rabaul is outflanked, and the once mighty Jap 17th Army, completely surrounded, without hope of reinforcement or supply, now has only the jungle and a date with death. Brilliant successes create new opportunities, make possible new plans, we don't need to drive that wedge between Waywack and Medang at Hansa Bay now. We don't even need to invade Kaviang. The grabs of the St. Matthias Islands have tossed out the importance of that. 
With the new Britain, New Ireland and Bougainville Jeffs already half choked, we can try something else, something bigger. The biggest step yet attempted in the Southwest Pacific to bite off the whole main chunk of New Guinea. Here's the plan. A task force of three elements will hit New Guinea, like this. The first unit, the 163rd and 127th Infantry, will smash into ITAP to grab the Taji airstrip. The two others, the 24th and 41st Divisions, will punch Hollandia at Humboldt and Tanamara Bays. Main objectives, three airstrips. Cyclops, Centeni, and Hollandia. But the grand sweep calls for a large task force moving by sea. Suppose the Jap fleet and its carrier-based planes makes one of its rare appearances. Admiral Nimitz will handle that end with coordination of all naval strength in the Pacific. Let them come out. But large operations require thorough preparation. For months, the 5th Air Force has been paving the way with bombs on Alexis Island and Mayday. Paying courtesy calls on Waywack and ITAP, and always bearing gifts. Dropping in on Hollandia with parafrag forget-me-nuts and in three successive days, catching almost 300 Nip sky buggies asleep on the ground. Smashing the convoys that try desperately to sneak through. Australian infantry pushing overland are already closing in on Madang. Waywac is next. Their pressure will keep the Japs engaged while we use the ocean as a military highway to strike their rear and cut off all chance of retreat. A coordinated amphibious operation is a tough job. It requires thorough preparation, thorough training, thorough understanding of the job at hand, teamwork, split-second timing, from the division. Each one of you is much better than the Jap. You're better physically, you're better mentally, you have better weapons, you're gonna have better support. So that you're gonna be able to lick him hands down when it comes to individual fighting. However, do not take him too lightly because he has that fanaticism which makes him think that his mission is to die for the emperor and he will do that no matter how bad the situation is. So you want to watch him, watch him as you would a rattlesnake. If you do that, you should have a little trouble with him. The regiment. Let me repeat again what the general said. If you have to run any chances whatsoever to get a prisoner, then don't get him. Just fix him up so he won't do any more harm. <laughs> but if you can get them without running a risk, get them. Now, when we get them, maybe that they will have gone for a long time without water, perhaps without food. All right, give them a drink of water if you like. Give them something to eat if you like. But don't give them cigarettes. Don't give them gum. Don't give them candy, if you have any. Don't give them anything that could possibly be considered a luxury. They will not appreciate it. And don't forget that a few minutes before you took them prisoner, they were just looking for a chance to bump you off. Treat them according to the rules of war, no less, and no more. The company. A company. We land in here. 
Moon Van, the Coconut Grove, Morgan. Company Perimeter. C Company. You move from here to the LC Iowa land in here. That leaves you then in a line roughly that way. Make your own perimeter. You'll be responsible for your own security. The squad. Watterson, you take your team, push this little draw, come out to a good firing position and fire from here without fail orders and keep the fire up. Tom can remember you keep firing when the magazines are being changed. Time ticking away, and rumors fly thick and fast. When do we shove off? A few people knew the right answers, and plenty more would know it soon enough. Because training ends today, embarkation starts tomorrow. The convoy forms. Some men, some guns, some ships. The task force slips out in separate units, a few at a time. Many sailings of small fleets on a single job. Why? Because by breaking into separate units, the enemy may be fooled into thinking that these are no more than routine supply trips to Sador, Gloucester, or the Admiralties. It's all part of the grand strategy. Now it is the morning of April 21st. Rendezvous off the Admiralties. Invasion 24 hours away. Warships. Cruisers. Aircraft carriers. Troyers. Minesweepers, a great fleet of floating protection, bearing tourists from 48 states. You may field strip your carbine, touch up your M1, or try to fill an inside straight. Or just pass away the time of day. But in some part of this last day, every mind will find its way back home. Busy is right, pal. Busy landing, busy digging in, busy being hungry and making your ration last, thirsty and hoarding your water, busy trying not to get trigger happy, busy hitting foxholes when zeros come, busy trying to keep alive and keep shoving, hot, dirty, plenty scared some of the time, plenty mad the rest. You said it, soldier, you'll be busy. The Air Force will bomb holes in the jungle and strafe the Japs half crazy. The Navy will bust open the beaches and punch the shorelines. But the unsung infantry will land through the surf to sweat it out till victory. Or the field hospital. Or the grave. A vast fleet full of American citizens dropping in on ITAP and Hollandia. To land to fight through and grab the airstrips is the itinerary of this first visit to Dutch New Guinea. Mark, the main battery target range will be 12,800. 
12,800 bearing 255.4. 255.4. Turrets, match to port, match to port. Turrets, load. Are you ready, plot? Main battery's ready to open. Aye, aye, sir. Main battery ready to open, Brad. You're on the line. Main battery loaded and ready, sir. Commence firing. First wave going in. From here on, it's up to them. Might be a shore full of jets, another Tarawa. Or, if barrage and surprise worked, an easy grab and push. But from the Higgins boats, all new beaches look alike. Barrage and surprise did work. Humboldt Bay, 115 miles to the west. Same day, same time, same chances. Once again, landing unresisted. It begins to look as if the Japs expected us somewhere else. Reports of progress come back to the Commander-in-Chief. General, the first wave has landed on schedule and had no opposition. Swell. Couldn't be better. Thanks. Farther west of Tanamara, the first wave landed with only slight opposition. Now the LCIs and LSTs hurry in with the main body. Standing up. Some of them. We landed on, on uh, White One, which is this beach right here. Yeah. Well, third wave is fourth wave. Yeah. Fourth wave. Reports come in faster now. No sign of the Jap Navy. All landings progressing well. All right, looks like some of the bay. Back at ITAP, the village edges the sea. You wait on the beach while patrols sift in ahead to spring the trap, if there is one. No trap. The Japs took to the hills, but the village crawls with snipers. Buffaloes come in handy for flushing them out. But sometimes you have to do it by hand. Like 
hunting rattlesnakes in a dark barn. We get a live one. Later, we corral quite a few live ones, but not all Japs. Some turn out to be Javanese slaves. Invasion becomes liberation for the beneficiaries of the Jap new order. The weary, the thirsty, the wounded, the sick, the starved. The landing party pushes on, and by six that night, Taji Airstrip will change hands. Within 48 hours, the engineers guarantee our planes will be landing here to provide cover for our converging columns at Hollandia. Surprise pays dividends. Total cost for Taji, three men killed, 14 wounded, eight missing. At Hollandia, patrols finger out toward the airstrips. The trail to Hollandia Drome is no promenade. Jap suicide squads see to that. Then you push on. Where there's infantry, there's always rain. And where there's rain, there's always mud. And where there's stuff that can get stuck, it gets stuck. The mighty bulldozer, part tractor, part tank, part Missouri mule. On the fourth day, Hollandia Drome falls. One more strip the Japs built for us. To the folks at home, compliments of the 5th Air Force. Two down, two to go now. Santani and Cyclops next on the list. The road to Santani is smooth going in spots. But in other spots, the Japs left roadblocks. Another job for the bulldozer. Kicking open the front door to Santani. A second column takes the water route across Santani Lake. Back door to the strip. The enemy tries to slam it shut. Back door, wide open. The foot troops move so fast they get there first. The fifth day, Centani is ours. An hour later, word comes that Cyclops has been taken. In five days, the Japs lost four airstrips. And losing an airstrip is one step toward losing a war. Hollandia and ITAP, two more notches on our rifle butts. Now, with the Jap 18th Army bottled up in Waywack, we could keep moving up the New Guinea coast. Wake the island. 125 miles closer to the Philippines had an airstrip made to order for B-24s. We could use it. At dawn of May 17th, the 163rd Infantry, jumping off from ITAP, established a beachhead at Arara, took Insamani Island, and set up their heavy guns to back up the assault of Wakedy. Next morning, the 163rd hopped off. Next stop on the road to Baytan, Wakedy.
Getting on the beach wouldn't be much trouble. Our barrage had seen to that. But back of the beach was the jungle. The Japs waiting there were no service troops. They'd help take Singapore. They knew their business. Their mortar and machine gun fire stalled the first three waves at the jungle's edge. But not for long. Sherman tanks are great gadgets to have around. fire ricochets off tanks. Sometimes men get too close. Then it was up to the infantry again. This is where training pays off. Infiltration. Firepower plus movement. Six hours after landing, the 163rd knifes through to the airstrip. More compliments of the 5th Air Force. The engineers begin laying out the biggest welcome mat in Dutch New Guinea. they're still mopping up to do on both sides of the strip. Like cornered rats, the Japs won't come out of their holes. So... to General Hama. Japs killed, losing Wakedy, 833. Americans killed, taking Wakedy, 41. It's good to see you. Make yourselves at home. We're six months ahead of schedule now. There's only one more obstacle to complete strategic control of New Guinea. Biak Island and its three airstrips, 210 miles further up the coast. Nine days after the fall of Wakedy, our frog-legged infantry leaped again. Biak was no pushover. The Jap knew what the score was now, knew that if he lost those airstrips, his grip on New Guinea was broken forever. He dug in along the shore, burrowed into the hills, struck back from the air, risking the remnants of his air force. But he couldn't stop our stuff coming in. Infantry, planes, buffaloes, infantry, artillery, infantry, tanks, infantry. The 41st Division took Biak in 23 days, ending, for all strategic purposes, the campaign in New Guinea. A campaign that gave us 18 new airfields, smashed 4,000 Jap planes, broke three Jap armies, isolated 100,000 Jap soldiers, killed 23,000 more. 
the price? 824 American lives. Today, New Guinea is a dagger poised against the Philippines and beyond.